If you have a Bible, please turn to Psalm 24 as we continue our series in the book of Psalms. I'll be reading from the New International Version of the Bible. Psalm 24, a psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord, and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gate. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Amen. This is God's life-giving word. May he help us as we consider it together. Times of crisis always prompt people to ask the big questions of life. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? What is the point? Well, the Westminster Shorter Catechism draws from the Bible to give us answers to the big questions of life. And it starts with the most basic question, what is the goal of humanity? Answer, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That is the deepest longing of humanity, to be accepted into the presence of God in order to enjoy and be satisfied in him forever. King David expresses the same thing slightly differently in Psalm 27 and verse 4. He says this, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek. This is the most important thing for David. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Why? To gaze on the beauty of the Lord. King David longed to be in God's presence. And you can look at the story of the Bible this way. In the beginning, humanity was created to be in God's presence, but then was exiled because of disobedience. However, in the end, God graciously provides the way back into his presence forever. Our psalm today tells this same story. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at Psalms 22 and 23. And this story of being exiled from and restored back into God's presence is prominent in both of those psalms. As his people substitute, the king suffers abandonment by God in Psalm 22. And he did this so that he could become the divine shepherd of Psalm 23, who leads and guides his people through their exile on a journey home to God's house. Well, here in Psalm 24, we're going to get that same story told from another angle. The psalm is in three parts. In verses 1 and 2, God is described as the creator and owner of his creation. The earth is a, a special place where God dwells with humanity. 
But then in verses 3 to 6, a problem is presented in the form of a question. Who can enter into God's presence? Something has gone wrong between verses 2 and 3. Sin has spoiled that perfect relationship that God had with his creatures. Finally, in verses 7 to 10, the question is answered. The problem is solved. Every obstacle is overcome. God himself has won the victory, and he brings his people into his presence to enjoy him forever. So let's consider these three parts of the psalm and see how they relate to our own lives. Uh, We are those who are created and yet sinful, and we need a perfect king in order to bring us home. So firstly, in verses 1 and 2, the world as well as humanity belong to the Creator. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and he established it on the waters. Here is a glorious description of our God as the all-powerful creator. These verses take us back to Genesis 1 and 2 and the creation of all things. God created an orderly world for humanity to live in, and in the midst of that vast world, he planted a garden in Eden, a special place where the first couple lived in perfect relationship with God and with one another. So the psalm starts with first principles. God created the heavens and the earth. He ordered this world for his human creatures to live in. And the implication that David draws from this is that humanity is to live in relationship with the creator. As those who belong to God, we are to live in a way that is in step with that reality. How do we do that? Well, Firstly, we can say, in one sense, that we don't really own anything. We often think uh, that we own our possessions or uh, even our own lives. But these verses tell us that we are merely stewards of what belongs to God. We are tenants on his land. And we, are, and we will be called to account for the way that we treat his property. Our creator expects us to be faithful with his creation, including our own lives. And that leads us to our first point of application. These verses tell us that we belong to another. Is that how you see yourself? Is that how you view your possessions? Perhaps there is some area that you think is off limits to God's ownership. Perhaps there is some area of life that you resent God from taking away from you. A beloved family member, a career, a healthy body, a bank account. Perhaps it is worth reflecting on what kind of a steward you have been with the things God owns. Another thing these verses help us with, especially during this international crisis we are in the midst of, is that they tell us who God is. We want to know whether or not he has lost control over this situation. Well, take comfort from verse 2, where it speaks of God bringing order out of chaos. And importantly for these days, these days, that he continues to maintain that creation, that order. Our all-powerful creator God is in control, and he is ruling over his creation. Nothing is outside his sovereignty, sovereignty, including coronavirus. So I hope the God of Psalm 24 is your solid foundation when everything around you seems so unsettled. 
So verses 1 and 2 show us that everything belongs to the Creator. We were created by Him, and we were created for Him. But verse 3 poses a perplexing question. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, and who may stand in his holy place? Well, the question feels out of place unless you uh, consider the early chapters of Genesis. There God created the world, and he made it inhabitable. And he placed the people he made in the Garden of Eden. And this is where that imagery of a mountain comes from. Genesis 2 says that four rivers flowed out from the Garden of Eden, which implies that it was elevated ground. But the prophet Ezekiel takes it further. He describes God's special garden as the holy mountain of God in Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 14. Many of us will be familiar with the next chapter of the story. Adam and Eve rebelled against God. They were banished from his presence in the garden. And the way back into the garden was guarded by angels. And the story of humanity ever since has been one of exile from the mountain of the Lord, that holy place where God dwells. Your life, my life, every life is lived away from the garden. So the question is asked, who can enter into God's presence? I wonder what you think the answer is to that question. Perhaps you think, you are able to enter in. You're a good person, at least compared to the next person. You pay your taxes. You call your loved ones. You give to charity. You aren't all that bad. Of course God will let you in. Perhaps you think it isn't you, but there is someone else who is good enough. Maybe someone you look up to, some great hero of the faith, someone who sacrificed much in life, and therefore deserves to be let in. Well, let's see the requirements for coming into God's presence. Who can come in? Verse 4, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. Now, this verse gives us an accurate view of God's holiness and our sinfulness. And we too often distort those two things. So let's see the answer to the psalmist's question. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Well, two main requirements for the one who can enter. Firstly, clean hands. This speaks of the way we live our lives, our actions. We must be totally pure and holy in all our conduct. Can you honestly say that you have never sinned in word or deed? Even if we were to start now and be perfect until the day we die, our past actions would still rise up to condemn us. Nobody has clean hands before the gates of God's kingdom. If you're not yet discouraged, well, consider the next requirement. Firstly, clean hands. Secondly, a pure heart. It isn't enough to do the right things. You have to do the right things for the right reasons. You see, all too often we think we are good people because we do right and admirable things. We love our family, stay faithful to our promises, show generosity and kindness to strangers. We work hard. We obey the authorities, we go to church, and so on. But the reality is, every one of us does everything we do with mixed motives. Our impure hearts are divided between doing uh, the things for the right reasons and doing them for ourselves. We have no undivided loyalties in our lives, which the psalmist puts into religious language. 
He speaks of trusting idols and swearing by false gods. Well, idols and false gods are anything, even good things, that we consider of higher importance than God. A pure heart loves and desires God above all else. The bottom line is that no matter how good we think we are, our unclean hands and our impure hearts disqualify us from entering into God's presence. The requirement is whole life perfection, thoughts, words, deeds. And for us, that is bad news. We are excluded from the benefits of verses 5 and 6. Blessing, vindication, and salvation that come from being in the presence of God. So who can enter? Answer, not you and not me. These verses leave absolutely no room for personal pride or self-reliance. We cannot put ourselves up on a pedestal. We cannot pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. This is so humbling. This is so discouraging. All of us, with no exceptions, are unwilling and unable to approach the one we were made for, the creator of the universe. Therefore, the only prospect for us is judgment, eternal exile from the presence of the living God. This is the bad news. But aren't you glad that the psalm doesn't end there? Every other religion ends at verse 6. God is the holy creator and only good people can approach him. So go and do your good works and, and you will be rewarded. You will be received by God. Well, that is the message of every other religion, not Christianity. God tells us that our situation is absolutely hopeless apart from his gracious gift of salvation. No amount of our so-called good works will ever get us into his presence. So God provides the solution to the problem. He personally overcomes every obstacle so that we can enjoy him forever. Question, who can approach the Holy Creator? Answer, verses 7 to 10, the King of glory. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he? This King of glory, the Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Humanity has been searching for a champion ever since God promised in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 that a conquering hero would come to crush the enemies of sin and death and the devil. And little by little, as the Bible story unfolds, we learn the hero's identity. He will be a prophet who will speak God's word. He will be a priest who will offer the final sacrifice for sins. And he will be a king who will win the great battle to rescue his people. Now in Psalm 24, that picture becomes a little more focused here we find out that this prophet, priest, and king will be none other than God himself. Verse 10, question, who is he, this king of glory? Answer, the Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. The Lord himself is the victorious king of glory who leads his people in procession up to the summit and through the gates into the heavenly city. And this is an unexpected turn of events. God himself 
will fulfill the requirements of holiness. Clean hands, pure heart. So that his people will receive the blessing and the vindication and the salvation promised in verses 5 and 6. A whole generation of people from every tribe and tongue and nation spanning all of history will enter into his presence to enjoy him forever. And in the New Testament, we learn his name, Jesus, the divine son who came into this world as a man to earn our righteousness. He lived a perfect and holy life, clean hands, pure heart. And he won the greatest victory over sin and death and the devil at the cross and the empty tomb. This is the best news in all the world. Two short applications from this amazing psalm. Firstly, Jesus is a king worth following. On our own, you and I cannot come into God's presence. We are sinful by nature. We require someone to take our sin and to make us righteous to bring us in. And this is exactly what Jesus did. 1 Peter 3.18, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. I hope you are humbled and hopeful as you trust and follow this glorious king. So firstly, Jesus is a king worth following. Secondly, Jesus is a king worth praising. God's grace in the gospel should cause us to lift up our heads and to see and acknowledge his greatness. He hasn't just left us in our sin and the judgment that it deserves. No, he has intervened. He has broken into this world to personally deal with every obstacle to our eternal joy. I hope you praise this king as you consider what a great salvation he has won for you. Now as we finish, some words from the final chapter of the book of Hebrews. Jesus suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace that he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly proclaim allegiance to his name. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Amen.